Hi, everybody. My name is Ann Cole. I am the executive director of the Maryland Federation of Art, and I'm very happy to welcome you this afternoon to the Low House Office Building Exhibition Awards Ceremony. Uh, we are very excited each year to be asked to exhibit our members and um, Anne Arundel County residents work at the Low House Office Building while the Maryland legislators are in session. It's important for the legislators to see the talents and passions of their constituent artists while they are considering items that affect us all. So thank you for participating um, and bringing that awareness to our legislators through your work. Um, when you have a chance, please visit the Low House Office Building uh, so that you can see the exhibit in person. It is open to the public during normal business hours, Monday through Friday. And all you need to bring is a um, driver's license or passport or other government issued ID to go through security. And then you can walk right into the building and see all of the work. So with that, I am excited to introduce our juror, Laura Peschini. She is an artist, a museum educator, and a visual arts success coach. She has a bachelor's in art in art history and theory from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and a master's in teaching and certificate in drawing from the Corcoran College of Art and Design at the George Washington University. She's worked at the Corcoran Gallery of Art and the National Gallery of Art, and is currently the Visual Arts Program Navigator at Anne Arundel Community College. And with that, I'm so excited, Laura, to pass it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Anne, and um, thank you to all of the artists for uh, for all of your participation this year. I wanted to go ahead and I'll go ahead and start with reading my juror's statement and then talk a little bit about how uh, I chose the work for this exhibition. So without further ado, it's been an honor to serve as a juror for this year's MFA Low House exhibition and review submissions from such a talented pool of artists. I'm incredibly grateful to the MFA for extending exhibition opportunities into vital public spaces such as Low House. It's a very impressive building dedicated to our state's evolving legislation and I encourage everybody to see the work uh, in person there as I did. The call was open to all MFA members and or residents of Anne Arundel County and included 254 submissions with a dazzling array of mediums and subject matter. Uh, as you can imagine, it was a challenge to narrow my selections down to the 45 works on view. So I let my instincts regarding style, composition, content, and innovation guide my process. I also considered works that engaged the viewer in concept and technical merit with representation from a variety of mediums. So uh, I, that said, I sort of let the technical uh, aspect of the work speak for themselves and, um, and the command for each medium. And then from there, it was a very difficult, it gets a little subjective, but I tried to pay attention to some of the main ideas that MFA abides by, which are to look at the communal ap application or universal application of the works of art, meaning how they communicate a message. Also, the sticking power? Uh, do I walk away from this piece asking questions? Am I, uh, is, it, is it engaging in some kind of dialogue? I know at the college we like to talk about art uh, having a life beyond the wall, meaning what do you walk away thinking about and talking about? And so with that in mind, I tried to narrow my selection down, but it really was not easy. We have such a talented group of artists in this pool, uh, and I really went back and forth. So uh, uh, I also want to add that the works collectively started to tell a story. And once I made that decision, I let them sort of speak for themselves. They were bookended, I noticed, a lot of them by the rise and the fall of the pandemic. And they recollect numerous shared experiences of imagery and spirit of that time. So what I mean by that is you might see isolated figures, engagement with the natural world, uh, quiet dwellings and identity kind of take uh, on a different context, uh, inextricably linked to this time in our history. In addition, recognizable landscapes that define Maryland's geography can be spotted in this collection. You'll see the Anacostia River, or suggestions of the Eastern Shore, and even the Chesapeake Bay. And last but not least, I saw yellow as a star across so many mediums. I'm not sure where that came from, but it just 
was sort of a collective a symbol of joy or renewal to me. So please enjoy as I did visiting this stunning display in person, bringing friends and family. Uh, they do have public hours and I want to extend my sincere gratitude to Laura Hardy and uh, the exhibitions manager and Ann Cole, executive director, and all the artists in this show for sharing their unique vision and their gift with us. That said, we can go ahead and get started with some of the awardees. And is Nancy on the call? This first one is Nancy of oh, Nancy Fine, the seafood packing house left vacant. Nancy is on the call. Oh, good. So I will, I will ask her some questions, but yeah, I mean, this one, I think that it goes along with some of the things I said in my juror's statement. I mean, this period of time, and I, of course, I don't know the date when all of these works were made, and I can't say they were all made during the pandemic, but just this quiet, sort of still abandoned building. And there's a lot of, I think, a little bit of mystery there. How was it left this way? And will it remain abandoned? And it also has this just quiet beauty about it, this, this space that's been left desolate but has little touches when you see this in, in person there's so many little tiny touches of color especially in that I think it's scaffolding on the left side of this I, I wanted to ask if she painted this work on site and if there was a history to this building or something specific that drew her to this was it the very fact that it was abandoned for example yes I like abandoned buildings I I like buildings that show character I like buildings that have a tactile sense um, to them. I, I particularly like this building because I come from a family of fishermen. My mother's family were fishermen. So um, I'm attracted to these older buildings um, on the Eastern shore. This one I painted with a friend and it was plein air and it was a la prima plein air for the paint Worcester County plein air event. And uh, it hung in the Berlin Library there for about a month. That's very impressive that this is all plein air. I didn't realize that. And it's just um, such a, a lovely painting in person too. It's one of those paintings where when I walked into the building and I turned the corner, I it, it spoke so differently in person than, than digitally, because you could see the impasto paint that you built up. And I don't know if you're using a palette knife in some of these sections, but I, I just felt like that that added so much character to this, this image as well. Um, yeah, and I, I used a palette knife for about 99% of it because mm -hmm. it allows me to get the paint to the uh, to the canvas, and I particularly like this side because I know that I can uh, get this done with the light that's available in there. Well, thank you so much. And thank you. The Winter Driveway by Katie Rickman. So this painting, um, you know, uh, immediately it's just this really interesting view because you have a, a view out of the window but you're also given some information about the interior of this space. And this bright yellow just draws you in against a cold sort of um, variety of winter hues in the background and this beautiful setting, golden color in the horizon. Um, there's also a reflection that's included and it, it started to make me think of Diebenkorn's work in a way, his later abstractions. And it also made me think of something that happened on Facebook during the pandemic. I don't know if anyone remembered the view from my window that was going around social media and spread across the world. And people were taking photos of a view behind their window um, and, and the view from their window and posting it from places from, you know, here to India. And it just made me think of this time period. Are, are we standing behind this window as a singular viewer um, looking out at the world? Um, you know, you don't see an individual, but it suggests that time period where we're looking out and just contemplating the world from behind that window. And 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 there's this beautiful symbol of hope with the yellow there and, and the warmth. I wondered about um, the medium because it says acrylic on paper on canvas panel. So I was curious to ask her because there's actually a texture when you see this in person where uh, it's more than impasto. It almost looks like um, a paper collage. And I thought that was just a, a unique exploration of acrylic. And I wanted to ask her how she did that, but that's okay. 
So yeah, we can move on to the next one. I believe it's Helios. It's by Petra Marie Bernstein. Did I, did I say your name correctly, Petra? I did see you on the call. Yes, yes, I'm here. And I want to thank Petra. you so much. I'm truly honored for this award. Thank you so oh. much. Well, Petra, your work was, um, in terms of medium, I, I haven't seen this before in person. And I thought, well, this, this really speaks to the breadth of different mediums that artists are using uh, with the MFA artist members. This is, if I understand correctly, it's a photo print, but it's printed on metallic paper. Yes. And this is another, this is another one of those where, and I think you did another one called What Lies Beneath or something. Yes. It's a water view. Yes. And when you see it in person, it takes on this iridescent quality because of the metallic surface that you're using. Um, right. It's also one of the few abstractions in the show. And I, I appreciated that as well. And uh, the, the colors just, uh, they very, they pop out. They almost vibrate, I would say, against each other when you're looking at, at this in person. I wanted to know a little bit about the title is Helios, and I was curious about that. It means sun or sun god. Right. Um, can you tell us how you came about? First of all, can you tell us a little bit about your process, how you made this yeah. and how you print it? So I wasn't, <clears throat> this is a very abstract piece for me. I do mostly botanicals, botanical photography. I'm really a painter, but I also do photography and I love photography. Mm -hmm. In the summertime, I had a solo show in Washington at the Washington Printmakers Gallery. And it was all things that have to do with the Eastern shore, flowers from my yard, water reflections, um, <clears throat> marshmallows, close-ups, and a lot of double exposure. So when I took this photograph, it was in the summer, very hot outside in my yard. And it's a photograph of a black eyed Susan. And I was going for a double exposure effect where I overlay just slightly. And then you get this iridescent feeling, except I came up with this, I uploaded it and the double exposures didn't look great they were kind of boring and then I started playing with it because the brightness of the yellow really I thought was so beautiful and I just played with it on the computer on a photoshop and I um, enhanced the colors and um, I made it somewhat iridescent see-through and when I saw that, I just fell in love with the colors and I left it alone. And if I had to go back and redo the whole process, I'm not sure I remember all the steps. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of my favorite pieces because of the way the two colors play with each other. And then you have all this fine detail, like you're looking through the petals of this flower. And um, to me, I think about how I was outside taking pictures of something really different than what I came up with. And I feel like sometimes you gotta go with just your in intuition, your instinct, and um, let go of what you want it to do. Um, the metallic paper, I don't use that much, but for this one, I thought it works great because it brings out the shine and it reminds you of a sun. That's how I came up with the title, Helios in, Greek mythology, it stands for uh, the god of the sun. And to me, that's what I immediately see, a sun, a bright sun, happy. So that's where the title came from, Helios. I hope I answered your question. You did. And, you know, it's funny you say that because you can't help but smile when you walk by this piece. It's just engaging and it has this surface that pulls you in and it's um I know the show is all two-dimensional work but it has this three-dimensionality to it that is often hard to achieve I think in some some forms of photography some forms of print and um you you achieve that here somehow through the the color and the um material so yeah thank you very much and then uh we can go to I believe the next person yep yeah, mixed messages great and Marilyn Lowney Johnson. If I mispronounce any of these, please let me know. Uh, 
So I don't know if Marilyn is here on the call with us, but I just, you know, I'm very drawn to this photograph for a few reasons. And it goes back to my juror's statement as, you know, I would look at it and come back to it and look at it. And it, it just stuck with me for a few reasons. Um, one is you're, you're standing here in sort of the first person view and there's some solitary figures in front of you. Um, I don't know if we're, we're on the high line here in New York or might be some recognizable Im imagery to some, but we are on some type of a bridge. And on the left-hand side, you have a sign about suicide prevention and right under it, no alcoholic beverages permitted on the walkway. And immediately your eye goes up to the next sign, which is about a casino and New Year's Eve sweepstakes and gambling. And you're, you're back at this first person perspective, wondering very much what the title says, mixed messages. Uh, you're wondering where to go with that. And it did make me reflect again on, on a time period where mental health became uh, so prominent in our society and um, issues of mental health and coping strategies uh, during a, a really difficult time. I think not just the pandemic, but some of the social politics coming out of that period in the last three years, um, some of the isolation. Uh, and it's not necessarily something to, you know, be depressing about, depressed about, but I think it's something to be aware of. And I thought this photographer brought attention to it in a really interesting way, you know, it's, there's a lot of ways you can talk about those topics and talking about it through the media, really, which is, which is what we're receiving when we walk along this pathway, we're receiving media coming at us, um, messages of all sorts that really deal with, I think, mental health and mental wellness and resisting negative coping strategies that are, that become more and more difficult during during times like that, during times that try us. So, and it's just got a beautiful surface too. this geometric, this, this single point perspective that just pulls you in and, and you wonder where they're going. Are they going to something positive on the other side? Where, where is each individual walking to on this passageway um, of mixed messages? So, yeah, I just think this one got me thinking a lot. And I uh, appreciated that one. So I don't know if she's here, but Marilyn, thank you. And uh, thank you for your, your new, unique perspective here. Are you, are you on the call by any chance? Actually, it's, a, it's the bridge across the Delaware River between Philadelphia and Camden. There's a walkway, and this is the walkway going wherever you want to dream it's going. It goes up and goes down. To me, the interesting thing about, I came up with mixed messages because everybody who, that I know that's seen this has had a different interpretation looking at the picture. Um, I mean, the, the one that first came to mind is, uh, I know somebody in New Jersey and his first thought was, well, you know what? People gamble in New Jersey and they spend money and they, drink and they do blah, 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 blah. So it's between the hope of winning and the thought of, well, what happens if I don't win? So that was what came to his mind. But I've had other people look at it and come up with things like you did about, uh, you know, is this supposed to reflect on where we are in society? The mixed messages in my mind is that basically everybody that has looked at it so far has had a different interpretation. Um, I looked at it and I saw the walkway going to, yeah, there's hope at the end of the tunnel, whatever, wherever you're coming from, there's a sky and keep going. And um, we can mix, we can move on to uh, density. Wow. First of all, uh, this is again, one of those where I saw it in person and I thought, you know, this, this speaks so differently to me in person than, than digitally. So I was very happy to be, to have the opportunity to see these in person. Uh, this is a woodcut, as I understand it. And you're drawn in when you stand back from it immediately. It is hard not to, you know, evoke this feeling. Maybe a, a, is it a crowd of people? Is it, is it a, sort of the surface of a water? Because at the top of it, you, you visually it reads as a reflection. It gives you some insight with this title of density, you know, it, and abstracts the idea 
by giving you a little bit of space in the center and whatever these, I guess, shapes are, they get more and more dense as we move on into the upper portion of the canvas or, or the print. Sorry, but uh, just visually and tact tactily, it's just a gorgeous surface. The colors, the, the like burnt umbers leading into the ochres and the yellows. And the way that that reflective area at the top is handled so skillfully for a woodcut, um, each little detail. Uh, and then letting this little negative space come through at the top where we see the white spaces to breathe almost visually, these pauses, call those the negative space, I guess. I think it was just handled so well uh, as an abstraction, as an idea. It, to me, it encapsulates this feeling of density and, and maybe is the artist here too? That sh is she here? I think this is I wrote Lisa Trevino. Lisa, yeah. I think you're okay, muted. Okay, yes, I was muted. Okay, I'm here. Oh, um, well, I would love to hear you speak a little bit about this, and then I can come back to some of the ideas I had when I saw it. But could you say a little bit about maybe your point of departure? Because a lot of times with abstraction and artists, is um, like Petra said her point of departure was that Black-Eyed Susan. So I'm wondering, did you have a point of departure in the natural world for this or was it an idea that you wanted to uh, capture? No, it was a, uh, can you hear me? Cause I can't see, it didn't, I guess my video is not on. I don't know. Your video Anyway, on. okay. Um, no, it was a photo actually of a watery area and it was all um, water lilies. So it was just covered with water lilies, this little pond. So that is the inspiration. To me, the interesting thing is that all the marks are made with a screw and a hammer. So uh, like at the top where the uh, little bitty marks, it's like I laid the screw on the wood and then hit it with the hammer to make those little marks. And then the bigger marks are um, just, just a hammer, just hitting the wood with a hammer to make the dent in the wood. I guess the one other interesting thing that I really like that you can't see is the dark brown ink is actually blue ink, but when it was placed over the burnt umber, it, it, you know, it neutralized it into a dark brown. And I always thought that was really cool. <laughs> I, I think that dark brown actually brings out it th that darker area and the tone of it, the warmth of it brings out the rest, you yeah. know, and it allows the rest to sing a little bit more. What made you, because usually water scenes, you've got your cooler hues. What made you decide to go with these warmer tones? Uh, honestly, because I didn't want it to look like the water lilies. So I didn't want that green, you know, and blue. I didn't want those colors in. So I just tried to go the opposite way. I, it's, it's a great choice because it just, I think it leaves it so much more open to interpretation. Um, but you give enough hint with the title and, and with this reflective area at the top. Um, can I ask one more time, one more question? When you, when you laid the ink just on the surface, and I'm curious, how many passes did you have to make to get your final? There is um, uh, one, two, I think there are four or four, I think. Mm -hmm. So the, um, yeah, I believe there's four, four passes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's great. And, and also another thing about this work, uh, it's something your mind, or at least my mind goes to making it smaller um, but in person, and as the size says here on our screen, 24 by 20 inches. So it's a little bit larger than you would expect and can very much uh, enter it that way visually and, and appreciate the layers that you created. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's also something that I think went back to that time period. And I'm going to say it again, is that we felt this feeling of density and, and uh, I think crowded areas in a way, and we were much more aware of crowds in the last three years than we ever had been before. And um, how do you talk about that? And I think that this talks about this idea of 
whether it's positive or negative, it really encapsulates the idea of density um, in an abstract manner so successfully. And I, I'm glad that you didn't use the cool blues because my mind would only associate that with water, whereas right. this is, is a different association and unexpected. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're, we're moving on to our juror's choice, uh, our, our top five. And I'm starting with Elizabeth Byrne, Bridgewalk. Okay, so I, if I remember correctly, there's only a couple of watercolors in this show, and this is one of them. So pretty impressive watercolor, especially when you consider these, the railing and the angle, the colors and the luminosity of basically what we're looking at is all in shadow. We're looking at these colors are all entirely in shadow. And once again, you're seeing this imagery, which, which I saw come out of this work, uh, this imagery of going through a tunnel, going over a bridge, um, going from one destination to another destination with these sort of single solitary figures that just, and it just pulls you in this one, pers one point perspective. Uh, you can't really see where they're going. You don't have that information. Most of the focus is on where they are in the present and walking over, walking through this space. I think you can make out maybe one or two figures together in the, in the center. And when you think of a bridge, you think of something that connects two places or two points in time to, to each other. And so just as a symbol, this was, I think, an interesting subject to approach and, and to choose. I've actually walked on this bridge. I believe it's in Richmond. I'm not positive, but you know, you are left wondering where you are and, and what awaits you on the other side, kind of like that, the photograph, mixed messages. I think this could be the pedestrian footbridge that goes to Bell Island. I'm not quite positive, but in any case, it's, you know, abstract enough in, in, in the landscape behind it that you don't really know where you are. It does feel very hopeful, like because there's on the other side, you can just make out enough light at that horizon um, on, on the land where, the, where they're walking over to. And um, I just, yeah, I, I, this is a very joyful one, really, when you look at the colors too, I, I think it's unexpected to see that many colors in the shadow and be able to masterfully relay that in watercolor. Uh, so I thought she did a beautiful job of this, especially if you look at the column on the, um, in the foreground and, and the light hitting it, the colors, and they're working together quite well. You've got some, I think maybe it's because of the compliments, the lavenders and the yellows. They just, there's a lot of color, but somehow it's harmonious still. And your eyes can rest in these silver tones, silver white tones in the back that serve as a little bit of a negative space or a pause for the eye. But yeah, I, I wanted to just congratulate her on an incredible watercolor and really un unique perspective and composition. Then Mike McSorley when I was walking around the corner and, and looking at this installation, this one just, ooh, it stood out. It, it's first of all, a lot larger than I expected. The way the paint communicates in person and the, and the colors, yeah, you really feel like you were standing at dusk right here in this spot. You feel the coolness and the shadow of it and that that light in the window, it, it reads like a hopper painting. I mean, I can't help but feel there's actually a painting that it reminds me of. It's called Second Story Sunlight. And it's a painting that's dominant, cool, who hues everywhere except that one second story light. And there's there's like a similar sunlight or really golden. I don't know if you've, I think we've all seen sunlight like, like that when the sun sets and you just see that golden reflection. And this window in person uh, reflects light like that. It really really masterful job of that. I was curious from Mike, what made you decide on this perspective? Because when I went through the show, initially I was thinking, you know, you could have chosen any perspective. You could have chosen the facade with light on it, which a lot of artists will do and do very well. But what made you do this? And, and were you standing there on site as a Sala Prima? Is there a significance to this building for you? And is there a connection with Hopper? Because he also had that ability to capture a period in American history of this sort of quiet solitude, this feeling of individualism in America and, and, and just, a, again, that quietness 
that, that maybe we all felt in the last few years. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those? Yeah, this was questions? based on a, uh, a plan air pay piece, but the, the, when the pandemic hit, I started, you know, I did about three versions of this based on the photographs and the memory of the uh, original piece. I was up in Cape Cod for the first time and the landscape did just hit me. It just looked so familiar because of, as you said, the hoppers, the light and everything. The light was just gorgeous up there. And uh, I did this in the morning before we left and uh, took some photos. Like I said, this is the third version because of the perspective is that's the way I could get the light to hit the, the house with the, the, the shadow facing me. So yeah, I mean, the hopper, I was definitely thinking of him when I did this piece. And there's a lot more to that building. It's very long. Well, and it's in the, it's these choices. I think that artists make that can make such a great work of art. And, you know, it's not, when I talk to students, it's not always in your hand, it's in your mind. It's in the choices you have to make before you arrive to that canvas or to that, that medium. Right. And in this case, it's just, it, and it almost reminds me of, we talked about the winter driveway where everything was cool and you just have that little uh, warmth in it that, that brings your eye to it. I think if you had done a part of the house where the sun was hitting the facade, that window, you know, wouldn't command your attention the way it does. And that light wouldn't command your attention. And it also leaves you wondering, you know, who's on the other side. It's, it's the only sign of life there. Otherwise, it, it, if without that light, it would feel like an abandoned uh, space. And so it, it, there's, you know, you wonder, is there a single person inside that window? Um, maybe it's somebody on the other side of like Winter's driveway looking out at us. This is one of those, you have to see it in person. It's just fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you. So Metro Tess, and it's this is by Jim. By Jim. Hello, uh, I'm here. Hi, Jim. Thanks for being um, here. Thanks for being here. I don't know when uh, this work was created, but uh, first of all, uh, thank you. This is the only silk screen I could see in the exhibition. So um, I really appreciated uh, seeing that. And then, you know, right away, I will point out we have a similar perspective. And this was just by happenstance that we have this perspective, this one point perspective that we've seen in some of the other works. Um, without the title, you know, there's almost this feeling of um, solitude again, the single figure and um, thinking of a time where there was a mass exodus from physically going into the workplace and all of us, uh, well, many of us working remote instead. And, and you have this figure here with just this single car in the parking lot and doesn't really feel like we're off to anywhere. Usually when you see a train, you think of there's an exciting destination and, and we're on our way to go somewhere and there's this excitement. Um, and while there isn't sort of a sadness here at all, there is a solitary figure and, and you're left wondering what's going on. Um, where is he going? Is he, is he or she coming from somewhere? And um, I, th I thought also of Jacob Lawrence's work, uh, these bright, beautiful colors all sort of puzzled together um, in this clean abstraction. And, you know, bringing your eye to the foreground with these lovely little lines of hexagons, which if they weren't there, I think the foreground would, would really fall flat, but you've added that yellow to tie in the eye. And I think it works so, so well to balance the, the image. I'm just wondering sort of, you know, I did see the title and, and, and with Metro test, I'm guessing this person was here to test something and that's why, but, was there more meaning to it that, that you were trying to interpret or was it just like visually appealing to you? What motivated you to capture such an unusual subject? This is uh, a silkscreen print, which I did a few years ago. It is actually based on a Washington Post news photograph and it refers to when the uh, Washington Metro was just starting out. And this is a picture of, of uh, a early yes. test run uh, on the Metro. Now, 
uh, I dramatically changed the uh, colors and everything of the Washington Post newspaper uh, uh, photo, put it together into this image. Well, I guess that's about what I have to say, uh, unless you, something else comes to mind. Um, no, I, um, no, I think I, that's I very think helpful. That's and very helpful. And I was wondering uh, how, was wondering when you decided how, to put decided that, to those foreground that, patterns, those patterns, in, patterns in, did that come to you right did away you or right away, did you add or that or later? Did you add that later? Well, well, there was a, a lot of, uh, thought about, uh, about what went into the picture. Uh, I really don't remember when I put the foreground pattern in, but uh, it definitely wasn't in the original photograph. Now, now there was another thing uh, that I might mention, which is the number, number five on the uh, train that I took from the famous painting by, uh, I forget who, but it's the, no I saw the number five in gold. And so uh, that seemed like a natural thing to put into my work. So uh, I guess I answered your question. In a way, it's like your signature. We know it's by you, it's the number five when we see it in your work. <laughs> well, uh, I have several other uh, works that have the number five. And it all comes from that. Uh, was it Robert Indian? No. Uh, Demuth? Yeah, it was Demuth. All right. Well, thank you so much, well, thank Jim. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. I've enjoyed your uh, presentation. Oh. And we're, I'm sitting here with my family. And uh, Hello. Uh, Hello. they are impressed with your eye for uh, artwork. Tell them thank you for being oh, thank here. Thank you for being here. Well, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can go ahead and Marisa Evangelista. We were caught in a storm or something of that sort. Acrylic on Clayborg. Marisa, I saw you here earlier. I hope you're still here. I'm going to say a few things. Oh, good. I see you now. I do have some questions for you with this one. I spent a good, a good amount of time looking at this um, when I went into the show and I thought, wow, you know, I know, I know you use yourself. I do know you use yourself in some of these paintings as a self um, portrait or the subject. Um, in this one, I was struck by this idea of, you know, when I, when I do read the title, it just makes me think there's some, there's something that happened before and after this moment, almost like a film still. Like I'm walking into a film still and I'm wondering what happened before. And I, I'm, I'm definitely wondering what happens afterwards. But I also think about that tunnel and that bridge because that's also this sort of moment in time where we're walking from one point to another and, we, and, and it's the in-between that you've captured here. So what I mean by that is obviously you could interpret this as a figure who got caught in a rainstorm <laughs> and had to wear a rain jacket. But with the title being we, it just, it makes me wonder what was the storm symbolically? What did it, what does it symbolize? And you don't have to answer that, obviously, if you want to, you can. But it, it also, I was talking about this painting with someone and it's talking about how we try to cover ourselves when we're in the storm with these, these little things like a thin umbrella or, an, or a raincoat. But no matter what, if you're in that storm, you're in that storm. There's really nothing you can do about it. Um, it's nature is something much bigger than us. And these, these events in nature, uh, whether it's COVID or whether it's a storm, or even if it's not nature, maybe it's a, a human relationship or something like that, but we're, we're some things are really out of our control. And yet we try to protect ourselves with something like this raincoat, which by the way, is this really happy color against, again, these cool, you know, cool colors that are receding into the background. So I am curious, you know, and, and again, you don't have to talk completely about everything that inspired you, but if you could give us a little insight into this storm or, or what you were thinking when you decided to depict yourself in this way. 
Yeah, um, I'm glad that you felt like it was per, um, a moment captured, like in a movie still or something, because that's exactly what I was trying to go for. So I made this when, during the time that I was in Micah, actually, and we were forced to go home because of the pandemic. I think this was after the end of my first COVID semester. And, you know, in that summer, I'm not a morning person. My family who is with here supporting me knows I'm not a morning person. So I just woke up at 5 a.m. one day, one summer, and I just had this such a strong urge to just paint this feeling like almost like we're all going through it. We're all going through COVID. We all have to deal with whatever ramifications will come out of it. But we also kind of got to take a moment and reflect on what we have gone through and what we will continue to go through and how we can heal. And sometimes thinking about how I had to come home and continue making art at home was really weird. And it was a little bit like whiplash kind of having to think about all that and having to continue that practice. But in the end, we have to make do with what we got. And of course, anyone can interpret that feeling however they want, because it's something like a storm. It feels like we all went through the storm, but um, there's no rain in this, but you can see the water coming down from her forehead through her neck, kind of like this emotional storm we went through. Well, that's, you know, that's really beautifully said, and it reminds me of, um, I don't know if anybody on the call today knew uh, Jerry Valerio, but um, he was a friend of mine, he passed away, uh, not of COVID, but during the time, and when I went to his uh, memory of life or celebration of life, um, one of the speakers talked about how Jerry said that more important than, than ever, artists need to create during times like these, because their work has such a profound effect on other people. And even if we don't feel like creating or um, giving of ourselves in that way, he said, you know, it, it's more important than ever. And I, I know he had been through some personal trauma in his life and that's when he went back to creating um, and, and left the workforce and started working full-time as a professional artist. And so I found those words really inspiring. Um, just to think of the role of, of the artist as not superfluous, uh, but more important than ever in, in times of difficulty. So, but yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Marissa. And I'm, I'm, I just, this is another one. I encourage everybody to see it in person. I'll say it again, but um, if you can get parking down there, uh, which isn't as hard as it looks, but do you see thank that one? Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, thank you. Ooh, the sun is shining through on this one, on my screen, I feel it. Uh, this is David Diaz along the river. Sm uh, small, little, uh, just lovely still life. Um, but more than that, you know, and I, I will be asking David if he's on the call a few questions. I think of this one, I just, first of all, when you stand back from it, it looks like literally painted sunlight. Just, yeah, it's one of those paintings where if you zoomed in, it would look completely abstract and you, you walk away and you can see the imagery come out. Um, there's this feeling of this return to nature and this, this sort of reverence with nature during this time period where I, mean, I don't know if we all remember certain animals even came back to waterways that we hadn't seen before. And, and a lot of us spent time at outdoors, you know, and with, with, I think the core group of people that we had to decide to be with really, and really made us prioritize that. And we, we see a little bit of that here, this small group, this connection to the natural world again, and, and the last three years giving us that pause to really appreciate it. I think, I really think artists always appreciate it, I have to say, and they're always tuned into the natural world in a way that I think is especially, I don't know, different. Uh, the, the artists just seem to have a unique connection to the natural world, but I think we all got to experience that during this time, that pause. And then, you know, you look at this and you wonder about sound. What, what does it sound like? Is that, is that, are those musicians in the right-hand corner? If, if I could turn up the sound on this painting, what would I hear? The, the water and music and maybe quiet conversations with loved ones and it's just very pleasant. And I think a, and a nice one to end on because it feels like a celebration, a quiet celebration of that time, uh, the positive that came out of a lot of negative. And 
you know, I can't look at this without looking at that lavender brush stroke, um, that whole, I mean, a little stroke of genius right there uh, in the shadow. You, usually in shadows, we see a little bit of darker colors that absorb light. So this is really unique to see a shadow that it, it almost reflects light, but it, but it works still. I think, I think of Schmidt and um, Ala Prima, uh, his favorite violet on his palette. I forget the name of the violet he used, but it just stings out like that. And, and yet it doesn't steal the show away from the rest of the painting. Um, it is a focal point, but it still is just enough to keep your eye, um, your eye rested on that area without taking away from everything else. So beautiful work. And I do want to make sure I mentioned there were some, there's so many great works in this show, a couple that I mean, I, I poured over these submissions and I wanted to add, I had, I wanted to add more to the jurors and the honorable mentions, you know, I couldn't, I had to narrow it down, but you know, there were pieces like relic and Italian still life and hair, of course, that gorgeous portrait. Um, there's, there's just so much to celebrate here in Maryland. And I often tell people, you know, please, please do not buy work from Michael's, you know, or from Hobby Lobby or wherever you go buy your artwork, please buy from local artists because the breadth of talent we have here really to live with these works in our homes would be just a privilege. And I think everybody would benefit from that. So I just want to give a nod out to our local artists that way. Support our living artists, please. Anybody watching who is not one of the artist participants, please spread that word. And does anybody have any questions for me, and do you or any of the artists? Hey, Jim. Uh, I'd like to comment that uh, I know uh, Melissa Evangelista very well at Anne Arundel Community College. And I'm glad to see her get some recognition. And I also know David Diaz at the MFA Gallery. And uh, I'm glad to see his work recognized too. And I'd just like to put in a mention of my mentor at Anne Arundel Community College, who is Jake Muirhead. Thank you for your uh, very insightful comments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jim. That was very sweet. I also mm -hmm. want to say something real quick. I'm just so impressed. I am always impressed by our members at MFA, but also seeing all the work from people in Anne Arundel County and getting to see their work and the Little House Delegates building during this time is so incredible. And congrats to everyone. Laura, you did a great job selecting all these amazing pieces. And I'm sure there's more amazing works out there. So thank you so much again. Thank you. It was really an honor. It, it really was. And I'm, I'm just glad I had the opportunity because I have been at Anne Arundel Community College now for a year. And um, a lot of my role is working in the community more than in the classroom. Uh, and I feel like this, exhibition gave me an opportunity to get to know the artists better of Anne Arundel County and all over Maryland. Not everybody is from, from Anne Arundel County, but um, it just gave me such an opportunity to, to understand our community more and what was going on. And I'm glad I didn't know before going in because I kind of went in with a fresh eye and it's it's been just such an honor and I'm excited to learn more and meet more artists in our community. So, and to support the MFA. Laura, I just want to take a second and thank you very much. Um, I think that your message of supporting local artists, local living artists, is definitely one that we at MFA want to get behind. And, um, you know, we are so pleased to have our artists participating in this show, being a part of the Low House exhibition, um, being there every day when those legislators walk through those hallways. Um, you never know what's going to trigger you know, a, a, a reason to act or um, or to speak up. And so I'm glad that our artists can be a part of that. And we're so thankful um, to have worked with you on this exhibition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone. And again, I'd like to invite everybody to go see the show in person. Um, if you are going downtown, you would park in the same place uh, the Gotts Garage that you would park if you were coming to Circle Gallery. And again, it is open to the public. So 
don't let the fact that it's in an office building uh, dissuade you from going to see the exhibition. It's open to the public. Just bring your driver's license or a passport or some kind of government issued ID um, and, and walk on in uh, to, see, to see the work and invite your friends as well. So with that, I wish everybody a happy Sunday and I hope you all have a great week ahead of us. Thank you all so much. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you, Ann, and thank you, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nancy.